All right, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, are we ready for the presentation? Okay. All right, good evening, everyone. Uh, as Mr. Philauer said, uh, Chairman Philauer said, since you all have this, um, I, I think I'm gonna go through this fairly quickly uh, during this, with this presentation and leave plenty of time uh, at the end for questions and Q&A. So uh, appreciate everybody being here, but let's go ahead and get started. Uh, I thought it was important that we talked about our, our mission vision and we'll see our core values here in a second, but we talk a lot about uh, excellence, not only in, uh, in schools, but we talk about that in the city as well. So uh, overarching uh, excellence in education is our mission with our vision being preparing every student for college, career, and life success. Our seven core values are here, and we're gonna talk more about students first in a second, but I think as you look at these core values, I think all seven will be used throughout this process tonight and as we go forward with making decisions for our school and our community. Very uh, excited about some of the things that have happened in our school district lately and, and uh, uh, years ago, but last year we had our Blue Ribbon School with Linden. Uh, we had six of our schools uh, earn a, a letter grade, very proud of that. Two years ago, we had four reward schools and you probably saw, thank you Donna for putting that out already uh, this afternoon, but that was released at three o'clock this afternoon. We have three reward schools and that was uh, Glenwood, Linden and Willowbrook. So very excited about that this year but a lot of positive things happening and we're getting better at getting better uh, every year. So going back to students first, as, as our team enrollment and facilities committee, we really talked about students first and having that be our number one core value as we look at this problem. Uh, so what's best for our students and teachers, prioritizing academics, and then I think these last two are just critical, being able to maintain and increase our program offerings for students and maintain and improve our, upon our current level of academic performance. I think the last thing anybody in this room would want that decisions going forward would, would impact those things in a negative manner. So uh, as you've seen in the, in the uh, presentation, we've got five main areas, population enrollment growth, uh, the facilities condition, our recommendation, and some considerations, and then timeline and logistics. So let's talk about growth, and I know the city's been talking about this, and we've got some slides from the city in this presentation, but I think we all know we've got a lot of new industries coming to Oak Ridge, and we've got a lot of new housing project, uh, projects that are coming to Oak Ridge that really are uh, growing our community in a positive manner. We're gonna talk about uh, how we've done this projection of growth uh, throughout this presentation, but it's, it's kind of a multifaceted approach. We've uh, had partnership with COPE since 2020, looking at this and updating with real-time data, as you'll see tonight, uh, city research, census data, and then I'm gonna talk about RSP in just a second here, but we've partnered with them, and we think that's really going to help us with our numbers and our projections. And then very importantly, this guiding principle uh, throughout this presentation, I want you to be thinking about this. We want to plan based on projections and execute based on actuals. So we're, we're not asking anybody to turn dirt in August here this, this coming year. We want to make sure these projections are accurate. And I think that's where RSP uh, can really help us as we move through this process over the next year or two. Uh, at TSBA, I was able to attend an RSP presentation for Rutherford County was very excited about what I saw and what they could do for a school district. They've also worked in Clarksville, Montgomery, as well as uh, hundreds of districts, districts across the, the nation. You can see that 97 projection accuracy, we think we need to be that accurate with our projections, which is another reason why we chose to partner with them. Uh, the contracted services, you can see we're gonna do an enrollment analysis here this spring a capacity utiliza utilization analysis, and then a boundary analysis when that's appropriate. They also have, I won't go through this, but the statistical forecast model methodology that they use, and, and we, our, our group, our committee was very excited about these, uh, this partner because they do this all the time across the country, and we think we need to be that accurate as we make decisions uh, going forward. This slide should look familiar, all of our developments that we have going on, uh, again, this is an illustration of potential growth uh, in our city, but we all know that we're seeing more and more new citizens. In addition, uh, another slide taken from Oak Ridge, a city moving forward. 
uh, slide here, and again, the same trend line is being talked about in the city uh, about new residents coming to Oak Ridge. And then you look at our census data, uh, especially the last three or four years, a 5.4% increase just in that time frame. We're seeing the same things here in the Oak Ridge schools. So you see our trend line with all of our enrollment. Uh, you have that COVID dip there in 2020, 2020-21. Uh, but other than that, it really has been a steady increase for us in the Oak Ridge schools. And here you see if that continues, what that trend line might look like based on projections in the Oak Ridge schools. And here is our elementary. You've had this in your packet of our four elementary schools. Our middle schools, a little more stagnant than our elementary, but all those kids in elementary are, are coming, so that they'll, they're going to see that growth as well and some, and some good growth at the high school itself. RSP will talk about functional capacity, but here's how we kind of define it so far. Uh, as we look at the elementary schools uh, specifically, we're using 20 students per classroom as where we're saying we're at capacity across an elementary school. And as you can see the example there, we could have a kindergarten classroom of 17 or a third grade classroom of 23. So for all these different purposes, we're saying 20 students. And why that's important, we think uh, more personalized instruction, uh, better behavior management, social emotional benefits, employee satisfaction and retention, and uh, shared space functionality with our cafeteria gym library, uh, for example. So knowing how we target or, or define functional capacity, here is the trend line for Linden. And you'll notice this last year we went down a little bit. We lost a large fourth grade class at Linden. Uh, so we reset that trend line, as you can see there. But if this continues, uh, we're projected to exceed capacity by 2026, again, on projections. If we go to Willowbrook, they, they exceeded projections, as you can see there, going into 23-24. And if they continue at that rate, uh, we're expecting them to uh, exceed capacity by 27-28. And then we thought it was important to show you just overall, if we, if we did some rezoning, redistricting, just the number of seats we would have left, we're projecting that we'd exceed elementary capacity by 27, 28. And in middle, we would think by 28, 29, we would exceed capacity. And then as a total district, 29, 30, again, based on projections. So that's growth. I think everybody can understand we're seeing growth in, in the community and in students. But as a committee uh, and as a district, we also wanted to talk about condition. And when I think about this, I think about the city, you know, the water plant, the water mains, all of those different things, you know, all of them need to be addressed at some point. And we feel there's some things in the district that need to be addressed as well as far as, as, far as infrastructure and just maintaining that level of excellence. So let's talk building age. Uh, we've talked about this before, but we've got three buildings uh, between 73 and 80 years old. And uh, I, I love this picture with, with Willowbrook from the, the old until now. Uh, it's it's a, a building that we put some time and energy and love into, and we hope to plan to continue to do that. But we thought it would be helpful for everybody to see this timeline uh, in this format and then also in this format if that's easier for everyone to read so you know when it was brought on, uh, when it was renovated, and all of those things. <clears throat> so after that, you know, we talk about uh, safety. As we talked last time, we know that three of our elementary campuses don't have a sprinkler system. Uh, deteriorating conditions in portables. We only have two portables at this time, and thankfully this one is not being used, but we certainly would like to avoid uh, having some of these portable farms. Accessibility, we talked a lot about, you know, compliance, and I know the city is faced with some of these very same things, but compliance versus the right thing to do. Uh, our elementary school, for example, the playgrounds are not ADA accessible at this point. We're, we're compliant, but, but is that the right thing? And then student achievement. We'll jump right back into this, but we're already converting some learning spaces uh, because of uh, the number of students we've had. So just some examples at Linden. I'm sure you've seen this, but here's the number of uh, spaces we have lost due to uh, excessive students. So first floor, we've lost those uh, places there. And then on the second floor, or the ground floor, excuse me, you'll see we've lost these places and we're trying to use every space we can uh, in this building to, to make sure we can go as long as we can before we run out of capacity. <clears throat> so we'll get right to the recommendation. 
we'd like uh, to suggest that we uh, acquire land on the west side of Oak Ridge. Budget for design costs and soft costs in 24-25, so that'd be next year. Build a new 800 student elementary school to replace current Linden Elementary and absorb additional growth on the west side. Renovate Woodland to become an 800 student elementary school to serve the east side. Renovate Willowbrook and Glenwood to become 600 student elementary schools. Restructure to move fifth grade back to elementary, creating four K-5 schools, two 6-8 middle schools, and one 9-12 high school, and then redistrict when that time comes. So that's the recommendation. But there's a lot of considerations. So let's talk about parity. Uh, we think it's important for our students that uh, one building shouldn't be built or improved while others are neglected. And for example, if one elementary school had a STEM lab, we feel all schools should have a STEM lab. The community, uh, we think we've got a long-term comprehensive plan here, and I think that beats a short-term fix where we could have uh, redistricting multiple times. We don't think that'd be a great move for our students and families. And again, creating the parity amongst our schools helps our community members regardless of what neighborhood they live in. Longevity, we're kind of looking at a 20-year framework. Again, lots can happen in a 20-year framework, but based on projections, we're trying to lay that out to what the possibilities might be. Later on in the presentation, uh, you'll see how we've done that through across the years. We didn't want to come here tonight and just say building a new elementary school fixes everything. It doesn't if these projections continue to happen. And then academics, I know there might be some questions on why to move the fifth grade back to elementary, and here are some. Curriculum is typically aligned or designed to align K-5 as most, more, as most academic systems and software are. The maturity level of fifth grade students is better suited to elementary school than middle school. Student testing and as a result, district assessments are scheduled K-5, 6, 8, and 9, 12. Social emotional learning curriculum is designed K-5, 6, 8, and 9, 12, and currently is fractured between buildings. And state accountability formulas are different for K-5 versus 6, 8. We know the question will come up of why not just keep Linden? So we made some, uh, some notes here. So site concerns and constraints, site circulation challenges for parent traffic, buses, and emergency vehicles. As you can see there, we've got one way in and one way out at Linden, and if we increase that campus to 800 students, it just compounds that, that issue. So significant site improvements would be required, uh, high potential for unsuitable soils and depressions, and the topography challenges uh, will be expensive to overcome. As far as infrastructure, significant additions and renovations would be required uh, for the capacity. Adding capacity would most likely necessitate renovations to the existing building and would trigger substantial building code and ADA accessibility improvements. Uh, the utility infrastructure is over 50 years old and addressing the above would uh, require basically gutting the building to the studs and starting over. <clears throat> Financial considerations, uh, renovations and additions could near the cost of a new building. So some of those potential costs, uh, renovating the existing building around 14.8 million, a uh, new two-story addition to uh, it absorb more students would be about 4.5 million, and then some additional site improvements of around three. So you could be up around the 22 million mark with, with just renovating and uh, an addition at Linden. Also our existing maintenance and utility costs are, are out of line with other facilities. It's just not that sound of a building at this point. And then we could repurpose a lot of the capital projects that we've done and transfer those over uh, to recoup some cost and also if we sold the land. So this is something I want to make sure everybody kind of understands and we'll take questions later. But I think one of the questions is, you know, why not just add an elementary school? I think a lot of our neighbors, you know, they just add a school, add a school, add a school. So when we do that, this is the approximate cost to add one more K-4 school. So we know this because we can look at our other buildings and how much staff it costs to run those buildings. So by just adding a, a fifth K-4 elementary school, you're adding about 4.45 million uh, to the yearly cost uh, to, to, the, uh, to the district, to the community. And this is where that maintenance of effort conversation kind of will happen and occur, because that's, that's all new money to run this new school. So over 20 years, you're talking $89 million. Uh, we decided to say let's keep four elementary schools but make them K-5. There will be additional cost as you can see here. So four schools time that six ti times that 621 plus the 300 for additional admin. Still a, a maintenance of effort discussion but at 2.7 million versus 4.4 million. 
and then over that time for, for our community that's a savings of about 33 million so that's the reason we recommended just expanding having the new elementary and not adding a fifth elementary school at this time here's that timeline so in 24 uh, trying to work on some acquiring land on the west side and then for FY25 asking the city to consider 2.2 million for those soft costs and design costs. In 27, again, based on projections, new elementary school, which in today's money would be 32 million, escalated 5% a year, you're looking at 38.8. Renovation of Willowbrook, as you saw, they're already exceeding uh, their projections. In 28, additions and renovations to Glenwood and Woodland, at that point, after that, we'd be able to shift the fifth grade to elementary schools and redistrict as needed at that time in 2028. We'd have a 10 classroom addition to Glenwood in 2028. And then additions and renovations to Jefferson and Robertsville. And again, remember that phrase, plan based on projections, execute based on actuals. A lot of this is long range thinking, it's projections, but if those projections came through, we wanted to have a comprehensive plan to share with you uh, based on those, that information. Also, uh, we just have to think ahead uh, as we do this. So some timeline considerations. We need to build ahead of growth. We need somewhere to put these students. So create space to move students into during renovations. And uh, as, as we've talked to our folks, a new school could take roughly 36 months from the time it's funded until completion. And, and we take that from examples that have happened around our region. And the next few slides just talk about uh, trying to stay ahead of the enrollment. So uh, making that capacity available once we know those projections and the students are coming. So at elementary, there's kind of your timeline of when we would do certain things. Uh, and the next slide is the middle school. You can see when we move to fifth grade, we take some of that capacity issue away from the middle school for a time being. Uh, but if that growth continues, obviously later on, we're gonna need to address the middle schools. So again, just in summary, I'll recommend, uh, I'll go through our recommendations again. Uh, acquire land on the west, west side, budget and design soft costs for FY25, build a new 800 student elementary school to replace current Linden, Re renovate Woodland to become an 800 student elementary, renovate Willowbrook and Glenwood to become 600 student elementary schools, restructure to move fifth grade back to elementary, creating four K-5 schools, two six eight middle schools and one nine twelve high school, and then redistrict as needed. So basically you have an 800 and a 600 student school on the east side and an 800 and a 600 school uh, students on the, on the west side. And again, based on plan based on projections, execute based on actuals. And this is just a summary of next steps that we would like to see happen. Uh, and again, we will continue to work with RSP, which we think will give us even better data and we'll be able to come back in, in August, uh, September probably, and starting, start to share some of that work with the council and with the board on what they're finding. So at that point, Chairman, that's the end of the presentation, but we are ready to take some questions. I've got some really smart people on my enrollment committee that can help me answer some of these, uh, but I'll, I'll turn it back to you to uh, facilitate that question and answer.
helps to have the microphone on. You've shown us a list of uh, expansions and replacements that you'd like to make on the existing schools, adding capacity here, capacity there, and capacity in another place. Uh, with all the things you have lined up, how many more kids in total would the school district be able to accommodate? Yeah, if we do the, the I mean, the 1,600 plus the 1,200, so 3,000 elementary, am I right, Peter, on that? Yeah, roughly, roughly, help me out. 200 okay. So the, the total capacity elementary would be 3,200, you're saying? Yes, ma'am. Okay, and what about the uh, middle and high school? Uh, the middles would increase, um, they would be at 800, or excuse me, 980 each. And the high school uh, right now has capacity to, uh, probably for what, another 10 years? Until right, we have to start we'll thinking about anything. Years. And the even, even then, so there are some spaces to expand in the high school. So you say it has capacity for another X years, but how many, is that 1,800 students? I think that's what we said we were building it for when we did the renovation. 1,600 students was the, that's the capacity of the high school, but there were a lot of programs that were part of the high school previously that really have been absorbed into other means. You know, computer labs obviously get repurposed for classrooms and okay. things like that. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Forgive the incognito look here, but I'm undergoing eyes, getting my eyes fixed, and so I'm just being careful. Um, on your slide called Students First, no, I'm sorry, the one before that says who we are. There's some terms there that I'd, I'd like to know what they mean, like what is a reward school and what is a level five growth district? I'll turn to Dr. Williams to, to answer some of those in depth. We get different designations from the state based on our achievement on um, a variety of things. When it talks about a reward school, they have a formula um, at the state and federal level that looks at our achievement, our growth, things like chronic absenteeism of our students. Um, it also combines aspects such as how our English learners do on their assessments. Um, but they put all of those together and, that, and that's how they determine reward schools. And then when we talk about letter grades, um, those are directly tied to our achievement and growth. Thank Was you. there another one? Um, one other question. Um, under, under RSP and Associates, you made the, stick, the statement, projection accuracy of 97% or greater. What's, what's the 97% measured against? I'd have to have RSP answer that question. We're not that deep into working with them yet, but uh, I think it's based on here's what they projected as what that enrollment growth would be and then how close they are to that, what, what they said it was going to be. So they have a track record of doing this kind of thing and so they compare what we, they're projecting here against what they're Th That's pressed. my assumption of where they get that. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Dr. Borchers, just a few questions. Um, I'm pretty close to the middle school and uh, it looks like, and I want to make sure I didn't miss this, it looks like the middle schools would be losing their fifth grade and those would be absorbed into the expansion of our elementary schools. And then hopefully that frees up some room for the projected increase in enrollment at the middle school level moving forward. So there, would there be nothing done to the middle schools to accommodate that or do we have sufficient room, for example, in the fifth grade wing at Jefferson to accommodate that extra growth? Yeah, I, basically we, we went back and forth with a couple of different plans here. So there was pretty much two ways you, you could do this. You could either expand and, and build with the elementary school and move fifth down or stay K-4 and expand the two middle schools. So there's only, there was only a couple of ways we could do that and we thought because of the reasons of, of moving K-5 down, it made more sense to focus on elementary to create that space, take off that, the, the capacity issue at the middle school for a little bit longer, and then when we needed to, when we saw the actual numbers, then start to address the middle school. Okay, and then I, d I did notice some testing issues, yeah. uh, K through five, six through eight, and nine through 12. Um, yeah, I mean, we're go I think we're kind of going back in time. I remember at one time we brought the fifth grade up, and now we're looking at this because of a growth in the city of Oak Ridge. Yeah, and I think the majority of 
districts in, in our region and our state would be K-5, mm -hmm. uh, so, so we, we are a little bit different than some other districts. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Bruce, <clears throat> got a couple questions. You, you mentioned about moving, uh, for lack of a better word, New Linden would be an 800 student population and then also redesigning Woodland for an 800 population. And you made a point in one of your slides about Linden being a one-way in, one-way out type <coughs> system. Um, Woodland in itself right now has peak par points of day during the day to get in and out of the school system. With the current population of Woodland at four something, right? Four, around yeah, 400 or so. Yeah, yeah. four sixty. Um, so if you're gonna double that school, uh, that would be a, a really a major redesign of that school. Certainly, you know, bus routes, bus places, uh, parents picking up, dropping off type deal. Right now, it's it's extremely crowd, uh, crowded through Woodland neighborhood uh, at the current size. Um, is that in line when you go to look at the design work for Woodland? Um, you know, you may be shifting entrances and everything else to that building. Uh, when you're going through that design process to accommodate that for an 800 student population. Yeah, absolutely, and I'll ask Peter to add some things in there, but sure. uh, yeah, we, we've addressed bus loops, uh, parking. Um, we, we have, for all of these suggestions, we have some drawings of what that would look like on the campus, but, but Peter, do you want to address that any further uh, to Mr. Hope's question? Sure, if you're familiar with the site, on the south end of the site, there's, it's pretty heavily wooded. Uh, I think that's an opportunity to expand what you have to create much better circulation. You get the cars off the road and start queuing them on the property them itself. And in the back of the school right now, there are two areas that are pretty conducive to adding classroom additions, almost independently without having to get into the existing uh, infrastructure of the school. Um, and then, as you know, we. The cafeteria that's already there is significantly undersized, and I, I think we've got a plan where it could be phased in over the course of time to not disrupt existing instruction or current instruction. Um, but that plan ultimately with the additional surface area, surface lots and, and such, would also really heavily alleviate the traffic issues that you have currently at Woodland. So understandably, that's a concern. And that the traffic issues is one of the things that all f four locations have certain traffic issues that you have to uh, overcome, especially as we increase capacity at these existing schools. You know, you have four distinct neighborhoods with these four elementary schools around them. Um, and, and my question is, as you look at this and go farther into this, is that you have, one, we have the adequate space to actually build the new additions to allow for the combination of more students at each one of these. Uh, traffic and, and safety concerns would be utmost among those uh, uh, besides the additional space that the additions would take. Are we allowed to compensate that in better parking for the, for the teachers, better parking for the, stu uh, for the parents, better flow, traffic flow, um, increased areas in those areas? So I'm sure that's all been thought about, but it is something that has got to be a concern for us, not just from a school system point of view, but certainly from our, our um, first responders um, and everybody that's going to be in and out of these areas. You know, how does that work and what's the best uh, formula possible for that? Sure, sure. Chuck, I've asked uh, uh, Mr. Lopeman to, as Dr. Borch has alluded to, this has been taken in consideration. He's going to plug in right here and actually bring up and show you an example of what one of the schools looks like that faces issues like that. Okay. So we can see that. You know, you brought up Woodland and the concerns there. And if you can see my mouse, I don't know if you can, but that's the existing parking area there. And with the trees that are here, I think it's, it's really easy to expand. And you would be able to create a much longer queue for a pickup. Um, we're isolating the bus loop behind what the new gym would be. And this is what I meant when I said it's, it's pretty conducive to be able to come out and do some additions here to create that um, additional capacity. 
And then the one thing, or one caveat we had to think about was you're going to be increasing it to 800. You need to be prepared in the cafeteria to have that level of capacity for serving as well. And that used to be the old cafeteria, which is now the gym. So, so that's it all started to fall in place. So that's, that's the plan we've come up with uh, for Woodland. And there was also some multi-purpose and some um, pre-K considerations on the other side too. One other question, Bruce, as far as, as this whole process goes, <coughs> goes along, I know you used a formula of 20 students per classroom. Uh, that seems to be conducive to what you want uh, from either a state or, or certainly a local level. During this process, <coughs> as whatever decisions are made and this goes forward, expansion goes forward, do you have the capacity with administrative work and administrative and teachers, does the classroom size have to swell momentarily why this is all being done or is that an option? I mean, is it 25 students versus 20 students per classroom? Um, is there, is there a, any, any room for that to be moved around uh, during an expansion period? You know, I think there'd be some opportunities, maybe if there was a short-term window of, hey, the new school or the new renovation isn't built yet this year, there, there's potentially some things we could do there in that regard. Uh, again, you know, we kind of, it's not my term, but as you saw the reasoning for the, the 20 at the elementary, uh, for instance, you know, we feel like we've got this special sauce, if you will, uh, of where we're going with our, uh, academics and, and increased uh, achievement and those are those are some of the things that concern me as you saw in those earlier sides is you know out of this process you know we can't lose ground academically or or lose programs during this so uh, I think we could get creative in a short term uh, timeline of getting kids in a different place um, but I but I, I certainly wouldn't want to you know commit to moving from 20 to 23 or, or increasing our class sizes across the board uh, for, for several reasons. But again, short term, we, we probably could figure out some ways to do that. And then my last thing for right now, um, as we move forward with this, we have to tread very lightly on the process of changing Linden. If you abandon the, the current location, that disrupts that neighborhood. Uh, and that could be a very touchy subject. I mean, anytime you, you take a school building away from a certain area, uh, that could be very, it needs to be treaded lightly yeah. on as far as, you know, how we handle that, how we go about uh, move forward into this process. How is that being addressed and how is that being impact on that neighborhood area? and the growth of that neighborhood and stability of that neighborhood as we move forward. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And, and part of the reason we're excited about partnering with RSP is that's part of what they do. So once uh, they meet with the board, we could have joint meetings with the council, they will engage in public, uh, public information, they'll have public meetings, they'll ask for input. Um, I think, and I'll ask my committee, maybe Molly, uh, I think it was either Rutherford or one of the other communities they were in the last meeting they had of their recommendation going forward, I think one of them had three people and one of them had 10 people attend. So for us, that really spoke to, they did their communication, they did their due diligence, they talked about and explained these plans. So I, I've been part of a large district uh, doing uh, this rezoning, new buildings, more buildings, and uh, to only have three people in one community and 10 people in another community show up for a final meeting uh, th they've done their homework if they've gotten to that point. But, but that will be a part of this process. It brings me to one other thing. It says in our recommendation in, in your timeline, um, the renovations at Jefferson and Robertsville, approximately about $8 million a piece in those recommendations. Uh, and that says additional capacity. So if a plan was put together and it could be executed, you're anticipating roughly eight to 10 years out there would be some renovation needs at either of the middle schools to help accommodate the 28 to 3200 elementary schools coming up through the program. Um, the one thing it does not address in this, and I don't know if that's just farther too far out to even think about, but as that population swells and it starts to move through the transitions through our school system, 
do we have the capacity at the high school uh, to handle that load once it gets to that level? Um, and the other thing to think about at this point is if you're looking at this long term, at that moment, you're going to be 25 years since the last renovation, major renovation of the high school. What, what happens there? I mean, mm -hmm. the, the last thing we need to do from a city's perspective, especially um, looking at this financially, is do we have another big push 20, you know, 12, 15 years down the road for a major renovation or a second renovation, I should say, of, of our existing high school? Yeah, I, I think that's a, a good question. Yeah, we, we haven't gone that in-depth at the high school. I know, uh, what, what do we call that wing, Alan, where we took down the IT portables, building on that facts section? Double A, we call it. But uh, if you remember the awful portables there that IT was in, you could come right off the back of the high school and, and make those additions. And, and again, remember, plan based on projections, execute based on actuals. We, we think as we get five years from now, we, we may need to get in that conversation you're talking about of, hey, they're, they're coming, they're here, and, and now we've got to get prepared at the high school five years from now. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, one last comment, and that is that uh, I really like your diagram showing that uh, our, our projections are staying ahead of the capacity. And that same argument uh, convinced the Planning Commission to rank the West End schools at, right at the top. Very good. And it was also based on your comments that where are you going to put students when you start renovating another school? And there's a point out there somewhere where the new school isn't big enough to, for all the renovations. And so uh, congratulations on what looks like a great plan. Thank you. Dr. Borch, there's a couple of questions here. Uh, as it relates to RSP, I, I'd, I'd like to get some more information about them. Uh, doing plans and coming up with percentages in the uh, uh, either the fourth and sixth, no, fifth and seventh uh, largest counties, you know, in the state uh, and meeting the projections, uh, I think are a little, uh, probably a little easier to do. I have a lot of experience with uh, Rutherford County and getting more experience every day with uh, Montgomery County and Clarksville. Um, but that having been said, uh, if, they, if they've done any work in any other school districts in Tennessee or, or comparable districts in terms of size uh, in uh, adjoining states, uh, both in terms, of, in terms of population, current population, projected growth, and uh, the number of students. Certainly can do that. Okay. Um, the second thing, um, and, it, and it has to do, and it, this was said several times in the uh, materials about acquiring property, um, but based on the last information um, that uh, uh, I, was, I was provided, um, there are 180 acres surrounding the schools. Uh, in our system. Uh, there are 21 acres around Linden. So I'd, I'd like to have some more discussion and analysis, not necessarily tonight, but going forward as to, you know, one, why you would need to acquire new, new property when we have 180 acres surrounding these schools. Uh, that, that's, you know, that's the, uh, that's the first question. Uh, and if the decision's made to go forward in uh, acquiring, and I put that word in quotation marks, that does not necessarily mean that it has to be purchased. Uh, we need to be think creatively about land swaps, particularly when we have all of this access property surrounding the schools. Mm -hmm. So those would be my comments. Mm -hmm. Mayor, if it's all right, uh, Peter put up what, if, if the decision was by council to put the linden and then do the linden renovation this is what that would look like on that property so peter do you want to walk through that just a little bit on what this looks like and and what it, what it is yeah this was this was toying with the notion where you would have um, more of a k through two and three through five academy and and just if you could fit uh, the other you know the needs of another school on the existing property and be able to make that work so um 
yeah, with you can see how limited that starts to become, just even with the 21 acres. Um, at towards this uh, back end of the site, which would be, I think, the north end, there's been some previous uh, subsurface conditions with sinkholes and things like that. Um, and then you're taking away a lot of amenities to squeeze that on to uh, the site if it's something you wanted to look at. Same thing goes with um, trying to create a whole other road in addition to um, some additional parking on the front and the side just to get that queue line off. Um, that's just an example of kind of what that looks like on, on that existing acreage, if you will. Well, certainly again, in terms of thinking creatively about the need for new property, uh, I, I, I would want us to seriously consider swapping acreage if we're gonna go out and buy you know, a new site. Everybody asked all the good questions. Um, <laughs> Dr. Borchers, I, I appreciate the student first ap approach to the briefing, but I'm, I'm gonna ask you to step away from that a little bit. Um, can you touch on the ability to recruit and retain staff as it relates to the facilities that you have today? Yeah, you know, I, I think Oak Ridge being where we are, are placed, you know, we, we do pay very well. We're one of the highest paid teachers in the region, so, so we haven't had a large issue with, with attracting and retaining. Now, uh, custodians, food service workers, bus, but dr bus drivers, th those are always issues that we're, we're, we struggle, just like everybody else, maybe not as hard as everybody else, but, but those are areas where we are constantly kind of looking for some people. TAs, uh, there's some, a lot of turnover there as well, but as far as our teaching staff, uh, that, that uh, our, our retention rate and being able to attract and retain is, is, is not a problem at this point. And then last question for me, um, you touched on it briefly, the difference between the accessibility uh, of the ADA uh, compliance and that accessibility. Mm -hmm. Is there a separate plan to address that regardless of what we talk about? Okay. Mr. Thacker, do you wanna address that a little bit? Uh, and maybe talk about in the slide we had uh, playgrounds not ADA accessible. If you wanna start there, Mr. Thacker, and then planning. Sure, um, we'll, we'll talk about Linden. That's probably one of our worst areas for ADA accessibility. Uh, the building was built in 1968, which predates ADA. We make adjustments to that facility as needed per students uh, or staff coming in. Um, ultimately, when you're looking at ADA for this site, topography is one of our biggest challenges. If you're ever on that site, the upper parking lot sits roughly about three feet above the main entrance. So you have to have a ramp to get to the main entrance. Um, you come from the back entrance to go to the playgrounds. Um, you're a significant 50 foot drop from the top to the very lowest playground area. And every level from what you see the blacktop to the playground area to the swing sets on the front. Those are three major level areas, uh, three different levels of topography. The playground in the upper area is kindergarten playground. We do have sidewalks that it get you to all these locations, but none of those meet the one to 12 standard for uh, the slope for an ADA. So we deal with that uh, when we have a student, uh, they get a, an assistant that helps them to navigate those areas. We did price putting sidewalks there that would get us from one level just to the blacktop area. And that was about eight years ago. It was about $38,000 just to do sidewalks and switchbacks to meet ADA requirements there. So we try to address these as the needs come, up, come about and we have a long range plan addressing every school. Uh, we work closely with Anderson County. Uh, they've come and talked to us several times made recommendations, we've gone out and tried to make, meet those recommendations. And those are things we do as a process. Um, financially, we're just like the city, we're, we're trying to do this in a phased approach and, and addressing those needs as they become uh, most prioritized. Does that answer your question? Before you go on, let me add something to one of your questions that, and Dr. Borchers answered. 
as the board, as we do our visits throughout the year to different schools and have an opportunity to talk with our teaching staff, and, uh, it, it's, you would be surprised, I think, uh, to find the number of teachers that have come here from other districts uh, wanting to come here and as our school district becomes I increasingly diversified in the curriculum that it's offering more and more families want to come here but more and more teachers want to come here to be part of what we're offering uh, and as we all know we can build these buildings but if we don't get the right people staff-wise in those buildings, the successes that we're seeing today are not going to occur. So we are fortunate that at this point in time, and that doesn't mean it won't change at some point in time, but we're very fortunate to be able to uh, complete the staff that we need in all of our buildings. Well, first of all, I want to agree with you, Mr. Philhauer. I mean, the buildings are buildings, but unless we have the staff that we have in those buildings and i'm not just talking about our teachers but our support staff custodial staff all those folks we have second to none in all of our schools and i'm really appreciative of that um, i'm looking at the recommendation page and it has dollar amounts associated with some things i just wanted to get some clarification and some more information about some of these so I, I pretty much understand the new linden elementary school and the reason we need to do that and the reason we need to acquire a piece of property somewhere other than the Linden area because I've tried to drive up there before and I understand how inaccessible that is, particularly if you're going to enlarge the footprint of that school uh, and make it much larger. Uh, and I understand the Willowbrook Elementary and the Glenwood and Woodland, especially if we're going to be adding uh, more enrollment to those schools, some of those schools. Uh, so that's an easy thing. Um, I'm going to go down to um, the two um, middle schools and it could, Dr. Borchers, you could explain this, or Mr. Thacker could explain this. Can you give me an idea of why we're adding money to that? And the reason I'm asking, you think I would say, yeah, let's add money to the middle schools. But the reason I'm saying that is, if we're moving our fifth grade out of those areas at the two middle schools, we're making room, essentially, for an increase in growth in those two areas. So. What are we What are we doing in the two middle schools? Yeah. So, once one of the 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 reason reasons for moving the fifth grade down is if you start looking at where the capacity gets to uh, to be an issue at the middle schools, the timeline starts to work with getting the additions and renovations completed at the elementary schools. So by the time you get to that capacity level, you're able to defer those that, that additional population down to where you have increased capacity. So the other scheme that he alluded to previously was instead of doing a whole, you know, increasing every elementary school, we thought about doing additions at the middle schools just to address the immediate need. So as part of the greater picture, you're ultimately going to have that population increase throughout the system and we're delaying that increase until you know that potentially 2032 2033 year so it, the increase increased population is going to affect the middle schools eventually but with this plan in place you have the elementary schools taking precedence if that makes sense I'd also like to add that uh, one of the things that we look at here, if you look at the last words on that, is address code deficiencies. Mm -hmm. So we're not just looking at adding space. We're dealing with the issues of uh, Jefferson being a 1968 facility, right. and we're going to have to deal with some of the code deficiencies that are there now or will be there in the future according to current code. So we are code compliant. However, there are areas that needs addressing as far as maintaining current uh, staying current. Okay, and and I do uh, um, understand as we transition to the elementary schools with larger capacity, then we need some room at the middle schools in the meantime mm -hmm. to make sure that we don't exceed that and the codes that need to be changed. I, I get it. So thank you. Of course. I think Ms. Smith 
has a question. Get the mic down there. Is this on? Yeah. Okay, now it's on. Okay. Um, I asked earlier about the capacity that we would have after the various school additions are made. And, uh, and adding up the numbers that I heard, I got a uh, notion that we'd go from a capacity, you know, right now we have you know, 5,064 kids in schools this year, uh, and the new capacity would be 6760. Uh, and uh, calculating that, you know, look, looking at that, for some reason, I thought that looked like a, almost a, like a one-third increase in school capacity but we're talking about city population increase that's in the high teens. So we're talking about needing, you know, ba basically, a, you know, having a, basically a baby boom associated with the families coming into town. Uh, is, that, is that a realistic uh, assessment that people coming into town are gonna have a much higher incidence of children than the people who live here now, that households are going to have more kids? You know, again, uh, planning on these uh, uh, projections is what we're doing right now. Now, we'll have to wait and see. Like, we're talking about the middle school now, but that's, that's quite a long ways away mm -hmm. to see if we're going to need that type of capacity. Mm -hmm. But if you take the preserve, you know, we kind of have a ratio out there of how many homes are out there and how many kids are coming out of those homes. So if you expand all the way out, as the city has shown, where they'll be projected, projected where they could mm -hmm. be in 10 years. If you use that same ratio, here's how many students we'd get out of the preserve. So that's kind of the take that we took on these developments going, okay, how many, how many kids are we getting out of these apartments? How many kids are we getting out of these apartments? If we have more apartments at that same ratio, here's how many kids would come out. But the best we can do is the projection on what we're currently seeing. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm, I'm concerned about whether we're projecting too high, basically, yeah, yeah. and won wondering about that. Um, and of course, I'm concerned about the cost of this. You know, we haven't paid off that high school yet. We've got another eight years. We're spending about four million a year on debt service on that high school. So you know, we, we don't have a lot of capacity to build new buildings. So that's always at the back of my mind talking about this. Um, talked a bit about Linden and the, uh, and the school site. And uh, you know, as a former Linden parent, I'm fond of that school. <laughs> um, and it strikes me that uh, if, we, if that school is topographically difficult, which it is, that site's difficult, uh, why is there an expectation that a better site can be found in West Oak Ridge? West Oak Ridge is pretty topographically difficult. It's not, uh, it's, you know, we, we, don't have s we don't have sites nearly as conducive to building a school as something like Jefferson. Uh, and has that been, you know, is, is there a reason to think that there's a good site out there that, uh, you know, if, and, and of course at, at Linden we know what the challenges are. At a new site we'd have to do new geotech work to find out what's there. That's uh, just, just curious about that. Yeah, you know, uh, th we haven't got into the weeds of what a potential site mm -hmm. would look like. I know Mr. Heeman and I have had conversations, mm -hmm. uh, and I think after this meeting, that's probably a conversation that we'll continue to engage in uh, to see if that is a possibility, but certainly mm -hmm. we're gonna need to look at what those sites look like and, and what other challenges they mm -hmm. may bring. Mm -hmm. This uh, Linden access uh, for, for transportation, getting kids to school, when I was a Linden parent, uh, there were there was sidewalk access that a lot of us used from Wyndham Road or from Wyndham and Montclair Road to the back side, the uphill side of of the school. That parent, a lot of people dropped their kids off there. A lot of kids walked from there, and I don't think that's being used much anymore. So we've basically, and there was another route I know from Miramar Circle that kids took to walk to to the school on, um, you know, basically a sidewalk that connected to the school property. Uh, so it seems like we've kind of created some of that traffic jam problem by directing everybody in their car to the front side of the school rather than having people coming by uh, more conventional, old-fashioned uh, transportation from other directions. Yeah, uh, I think you, you've uh, touched on a, an interesting point. You know, we just have, it seems like we have a lot of parents 
that seem to think they have to get in the car and drop their student off. You know, if we could control yeah. what, how parents brought their students to school, we might be able to alleviate some of those but things. I, but I think that closed sidewalks have been a challenge sometimes, so that parents would drop a kid off at a sidewalk and discover that the sidewalk was locked, so the kids had to be driven to another location. So it's a, so I would recommend that if traffic is a challenge, we need to make use of the ways that people used to get kids to those schools. That uh, we used, you know, I, I know a lot of parents dropped kids off at the Wyndham Road side, and I'm not sure that that's happening as much anymore because of closed access. So that's uh, just a possible partial solution to one of the problems you're, <laughs> you're describing right now. Uh, and related to the Linden property, uh, one interesting situation is that uh, the car situation in the, in the adjoining areas. The city owns a lot of property near Linden now that was acquired because of karst conditions, sinkhole conditions, on the, uh, on the property. I know that there are restrictions on what can be done with that property. It can't be used to build buildings. It can't be used for housing. It can't be sold, I don't think. But, uh, but, I, but it strikes me that there may be some uses that would be legal for some of that adjoining land uh, that would enable some more flexibility on that, on that property to move, move things around on the land that's not restricted by putting some sorts of uses, possibly parking, possibly playground facility or something on that adjoining on that adjoining space. Uh, so that's something to think about, because uh, there is a lot of land there, and uh, the possibility of using it beneficially uh, impresses me, because I'd hate to see that school go away for the benefit of the neighborhood in general. Uh, so, uh, and, and, the, uh, and particularly the portions closest to the school, there's some, that there's, there's mixed neighborhoods associated with Linden, and uh, the areas on the um, south side of the school are one of our low-income neighborhoods now in the city, and I'd hate to see that area lose its school, because that would be a further, further damage to that neighborhood. So that's concern. Thanks. Ms. McLean has some a couple of questions. I was wondering, do we know how many kids are coming from the preserve and how long the bus ride is from the preserve to Linden? Yeah, I can pull up the um, preserve here. While Peter looks for that, I can tell you that we now have a designated bus that basically goes to the preserve and, and it's not combined with the middle school. We have combined the middle school run with the high school, so that runs a little bit longer. I know they're under an hour, uh, and yeah. basically that is the standard. But we would all agree 50 minutes to an hour is still too long, but, but we are keeping all runs under an hour. Right, so an advantage to building a school a little farther west would be the, um, the bus ride wouldn't be as far for those kids, because 50 minutes is still a long time on the bus. And that is correct. And originally we had, you know, so few students at each level, then we did combine other routes with that. But now due to the increased enrollment for students from the preserve, then we're allowed to run a bus. And, and I will confirm, Ms. Smith, we still use that rear entrance to Linden. Parents who take advantage of that, that is a quicker way. Uh, I will tell you we're living in different times, and some parents are not comfortable with students walking even a short distance to school as it was 20, 30 years ago. So. Uh, yes, sir. Two, two comments. Um, I, your, Dr. Borchers, your predecessor tried having all the students within one mile walk to the schools, and that did not go over well. And um, also, <clears throat> I've kind of been in the trenches in the schools. I've served as a room mother in three, di three different times in two different schools, and, and um, I was an advisor to the Technology Students Association when Mr. Lay was at Jefferson. And I, for one, do not think that fifth graders are ready for middle school. And so that's why, that's another reason I liked your capacity versus projections charts. 
and, and to set the record straight, we always referred to you as a room dad. Okay. Bruce, two other things to think about is that I, I'm sure you, these are going to be ongoing conversations between you and Mr. Heeman um, going forward. Um, you know, the 800-pound gorilla in the room is the $77 million price tag. I mean, that's what it is. Um, we've got to figure out a way to, you know, is, is that the right number? Is it the right capacity? Um, along with those potential student population growth, um, that 2,000 homes, that's 2,000 more households within the city, that brings in 2,000 more families that not only have school-aged children, but are also going to be um, part of the city services that we have to be uh, cautious of all over, not just um, from a student population, but our infrastructure, our streets, our water mains, like you said earlier, all that becomes part of that. And um, is the potential growth in our capacity to pay for something like this there? And does that align with the timeline that we need for our student population to be able to um, house the students, that potential increase in students, in the right facilities? Uh, that's going to be the big question that's not just among you all on the school board, but us as city council members. We're going to have to have a, you know, some long talks. Uh, our budget and finance committee on our city, our city council is going to have to have some really in-depth conversations. Um, Janice is going to have to have those in-depth conversations with Mr. Heeman as he comes forward and starts this whole process. Um, you know, we got to be able to figure out how do we pay for it over and above what we do with the school system, we have all the other things that we have. And there's a number of different projects that are on the board right now that's in the slate. And we're, we, we are still having that conversation with Mr. Heeman as a, as a council body. You know, what, what priorities do we put in what you know, area? Students are always gonna be a top priority for Oak Ridge. They have always been, they've been, there's a decades of, of showing that we've always, taking our very, uh, a lot of pride in making sure we give the right education to our students. But it has to be balanced with all the other city needs and services that we have. As we increase population, that also increases staff, not just for you guys and teachers and administrators and, and all the uh, facilities, but it also in increases our staff on, on the city side as well. Um, all of our, our services that we have, uh, whether it's public works, whether it's public safety, all of those needs and capital needs are going to have to be met. So that's going to be a big deal. Um, the other question that we are going to have and we're going to be faced with, whether it's now or two years down the road or five years down the road, as capacity starts to increase, um, us being a, a city funded school system, you know, the maintenance of effort is just also going to have to be addressed. You know, how long can we stretch that dollar combined with all the other federal and state dollars that are out there, county dollars that are out there, where does that come into play? It's not just the buildings or the personnel to funnel the buildings that we need for that, but we're gonna have to, you know, we're gonna have to look at that and address that as well. And, and I think, Chuck, on that point, I mean, that, that is, I think, a very serious issue as we move forward. Um, when you look at those two plans, with a slide where I had five elementary schools versus four, the additional cost for that staff. Uh, the, our, our budget, we're about 82% uh, on, on people. So, so if there's no additional revenue, the only thing we can do is cut people to pay for those things. And then when we do that, this, this steam rolls, and I think Mr. Philauer said it earlier, you know, you start cutting programs, and some of those programs are the programs that people are coming into this community for, because they want aviation, they, they, they want some of those different things. And unfortunately, those programs that have the least number of students are the first ones to go. But they also are, you know, we offer an AP course that nobody else does, but it's got 11 kids in it. But we can offer that currently. But if we start to get in this mode of, well, you can have the building, but we can't give you any more money, the only thing we have to access is, is people for the most part. So, so it, it will be. This is going to be a... Uh, a journey between council board and, and uh, some teamwork with all the competing priorities you guys have and have addressed, 
or will be addressing, but, but it, it, it is part of this discussion. And Chuck, I thank you. Very simply put, when, with two words, we have to figure this out because if we don't figure it out, we can't come back and all of a sudden say, remember we had that meeting on February the 20th and we talked about this and now it's happening, but we never did anything about it. Now what are we going to do? So th you're absolutely right. We, within this body, we've got to figure it out and we've got to be able to take action and have a plan. And it's got to be a plan that is a movable plan it, because this, what we're talking about is movable. We don't know numbers. They are projections, and, but we have, to, we have to figure it out. Yes, Mr. Philhauer, I'm looking at the population growth, um, illustration of potential growth, and it has all the different developments that we have, and thank goodness we're doing so well there. Uh, particularly, I'm going to single out the one at the top of the list, the preserve at the Clinch River. In fact, it's growing. We have 90, 90, 90, 90 all the way down the, the row here. Uh, at the end, it's 640, and if you're looking at the totals of all the other developments, that's 2066, so it's almost one-third of all the growth that we have in the city of Oak Ridge. And I know you and I had an opportunity to visit the preserve and look at a potential site and talk with them about location out there. I wish it wasn't so far out west. I wish it was west, but not that far out for the, you know, the location of maybe a, a new Linden Elementary School in that area. And that would be great for everybody who lived there, for those kids and those parents to be able just to walk and not have to endure that bus drive that's 20 minutes one way and 20 minutes the other way. So um, my next question would be this, Dr. Borchers, have we considered potential sites for a new school at this point? You know, th there's been discussion and dialogue, but, but we have not narrowed anything down as far as this site, that site. Uh, th this is more about, and, and if I can, maybe bring it back to that slide I showed you, that our elementary seats will be out of capacity by 27-28 on current projections. So I, I don't want us to get stuck on step 187 when we're on step 5. Um, because that's why we have to make sure these kids are coming and we actually have to do all these other things down that list. But we do have, at this point, a, a three-year window where we'll be out of, out of seats at the elementary level. So it, it does bring up the elementary issue, finding a site, talking about that. And I think, as I said earlier, I think that's now, uh, if the council asks Randy to do that, for Randy and I uh, to start having that conversation about potential sites. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, talking about the location of something like a school at uh, the preserve, um, of course, if, if a new school were built there to serve West Oak Ridge, all the other kids in West Oak Ridge would be taking that hour bus ride, so that there's an interesting challenge there. Uh, but one thought, one thing I've wondered about looking at the situation at the preserve, uh, what has to do with uh, a school that was close to where my my in-laws lived in the uh, Chicago suburbs, where for some reason they had built a K-2 school in that neighborhood. Uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't far from anywhere else. It was a fairly high density, older suburb. And, and I never really understood why they had a K-2 school, but I've thought about the notion that uh, for a situation of a lot of little kids coming from the preserve, taking long bus rides to Linden, uh, something like a limited school of you know K2, K1, whatever, might be an interesting solution specific to that neighborhood. I have no idea whether anybody would think that was a sensible thing to do, but I was curious about uh, whether there are a creative solutions like that that might help uh, alleviate some of the challenges of kids who live pretty far away from the school. Yeah, I think that could be more discussion going forward. You know, as uh, over the year and a half, we've talked about a lot of solutions, K2, K5, you know, how could you split those up? So we have talked about numerous different solutions, but the solution in front of you tonight was what 
uh, we came down with after talking to our board, having a, a board retreat. This was our, our number one uh, proposal uh, going forward. But it doesn't mean we can't have further discussions. But at this point, this is our best work. On shut. Sorry. I wanted to stress again that this is a new system for them. This has been possible. I mean, if you know the, the existing plans and features that allow for future expansion, we're going to run into the ecosystem now, and it's it's got to be it's got to start to gel with this new central uh, you know population growth and the activity of people how this process. That, that's a good question, Chuck. I think we're about 200 students, Mr. Lay, is that correct? So we're about 200 students. We have a couple of classrooms that would be available out there, but I think you're correct. I mean, I, I think if the numbers keep coming, we probably would have to have a conversation of do we need to add on like we proposed with that new building at some point? Uh, but that's, that's not part of what we've been working on thus far, but I, I do think it's something we have to watch. Anyone else? Yeah, part of our work with RSP, once we're already giving them tons of documents that they've requested, uh, they've worked, they've asked for the GIS contact at the city, for instance. So they're going to be looking at all of these developments uh, with a much more uh, laser-like focus. Well, I shouldn't say much more, but with a different focus of what their uh, role is. So our, our hope is by the time next fall rolls around, when school, not fall, when summer rolls around and we start in July and August, that, that we'll have a very good indication of here, here's our enrollment projections. Yeah, so the, the West End, that, that's our, yep, yeah, yep, that's our biggest issue right now. Yeah. Right. Yep, and that's what we'll certainly do. I'm sure this is being done, but just in case it isn't, and from uh, the city side, uh, one thing that helps in those projections is if and when you become aware that new developments are potential, new apartment complexes, new subdivisions, that certainly is something that needs to be plugged in as we move forward. Uh, I know uh, it's been some time, maybe a year ago, uh, when I took the drive up on the hill and I was amazed. <laughs> I didn't expect to see what I saw there. So it can happen overnight, I guess, almost when uh, people decide they want to come to Oak Ridge and they need to have places to live. So that will be an important factor. Ms. McLean. Um, the development that's being proposed in the Scarborough neighborhood, we haven't put that on our recommendation here so that's another new one if I, if I might um, I, I know there's a lot of discussion about the projections and capacity but we, we need not lose sight of the fact that uh, a, a lot of the impetus behind this is the condition of these schools as well and when there was a point in one of the slides about building ahead of the capacity the idea is we <coughs> instead of it's impossible. Logistically, it's, it's very, very difficult to renovate these schools with students in them. And so the idea is we would expand those schools, um, create the additional capacity, move students into that additional space to allow us to do a phased renovation while students are there. So it's, it's, you, you can't separate the two, if, if that makes sense, and I don't want us to lose sight of that.
CIP and, and Jim and Charlie y'all could talk to this better. It's been in front of the Planning Commission. I know like this coming year, don't we have a new roof set to go? Alan, you may be able to pipe in. Woodlands is scheduled for the new roof. Also, Woodlands is going to be scheduled at some point in the near future for an expansion and renovation. So uh, is there any way that we can, um, you know, certainly help um, cost-saving measures as we go forward with some of this? This may be information that's got to go back to Planning Commission or ultimately back up to City Council. Are we putting the right dollars in at the right spot on the school facilities if there's potential for renovation? You know, I'd hate to put a new roof on and then realize okay, we're going to tear part of the new roof out to accommodate uh, some of the expansion or and I'm just using that as an example don't get me wrong Wood, Woodland desperately needs the new roof we understand that and it's time to put the new roof on but as we go forward with these facilities are there things that we have set right now in in the normal order of the CIP that we may have to modify to help accommodate some of that I mean that's something that both the school system and and city services are all going to have to work very closely on to watch because you know, we don't want to, we don't want to, I, I, I hate to use the word waste tax dollars, but we have to make sure we're very cautious of how we spend those tax dollars. Um, we definitely need to make sure that we maintain our facilities at a high level, but, you know, we've delayed in some of the processes before, um, so we need to be cautious of that. I mean, you know, like the, uh, the cafeteria at Woodland needs some work. I mean, it just doesn't handle the capacity as it is now, the current ca cafeteria. So that's another area that I know will be renovated with an addition to that school system. Are we going to spend money now and then turn around and spend money right again to tear it back out to accommodate for a bigger school? So it's just some of the things that we need to be thinking about as this whole conversation moves along. I think that's a great point, Chuck. And, and I think as we... Uh, after tonight, if, if we get to a place where we can agree on this does look like the potential path forward, that uh, partnering with Randy our, and, and both of our leaderships, uh, our teams, to be able to do that and plan out, okay, here's when we would do this, here's how we would fund it, here's when, uh, I think that makes perfect sense. So do I hear as a consensus that the next step is the continued conversation between the superintendent and the city manager on this topic to continue to move us forward. And I'll leave you with this thought, and I, Ms. Smith, I, I, I hope we have a baby boom, but I don't know whether we will or not. But I was at a social event over the holidays, and to the uh, families that were there live in Hardin Valley. One of them has two kids and one has three kids. And they both told me, I didn't initiate the conversation, but they came to me and said, if we could find a place to build in the Oak Ridge, we would move there tomorrow. And I think that's what we're seeing in the schools and in our community. So we just need to be prepared. We, we had a baby boom. We just call it COVID. Yeah. <laughs> Those kids are two and three years old now. I have a grandchild because of COVID. So, you know, I'm just saying, we, we have that. They're coming. Yeah. <laughs> they're not quite, quite pre preschool yet, but they're coming. Yeah, good point. Thank you all, each of you, for your time. Uh, we look forward to continued discussions on this topic and other topics that will help benefit the Oak Ridge Schools and our community. Have a great evening. Thank you.